Welcome everyone to the final panel of Generation Analog 2023. This is a panel we call Making Sense of Mechanics. And uh, I'm just uh, delighted to be here again with researchers from all over the world who are uh, commenting on, again, the core aspects of a game design, which is the mechanical aspects. And uh, without too much uh, delay from me, uh, we will just begin with our first presenter. Um, that would be Leonid uh, Moises, who is uh, presenting a talk um, specifically on Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and so uh, take it away, Leonid. Hello, <clears throat> Hello everyone. Yeah, in case you didn't have enough of Dungeons and Dragons in the previous panel, uh, here I am. Uh, so uh, I'm a scholar studying the representation of religion and uh, role-playing games. Uh, originally, I come from Moscow, Russia. I currently reside in Montenegro. And uh, I wanted to start the talk with two brief disclaimers. First, and uh, I start all my talks in the recent months with this, I would like to say thank you for allowing me to participate in the conference uh, while my country is continuing the brutal invasion of Ukraine. Uh, I want to acknowledge my full responsibility as a Russian citizen for this, and I want to call everyone here to provide whatever help they can to Ukraine in its struggle. Second, uh, before I will start my presentation, I wanted to say that I can easily imagine how things that I will be saying <laughs> could be appropriated, but let's put it mild, mildly conservative gamers, you know, uh, of the alt conservative variety. And uh, considering the fact that uh, I will be talking about a very problematic topic of race and game, and uh, I know like a white guy from a colonial empire talking about uh, uh, race in uh, games, it's already problematic enough. I really hope I won't, um, my research won't be used in that way. I really hope I won't... Uh, say anything offensive, please bear in mind that this is a work in progress and it is a part of a much bigger research of relationships between role-playing games and enchantment. So uh, you will see why it is so. And uh, I really hope that you will help me to set my research in the correct direction. So let's begin. Uh, let me share the slide. Uh, so Role-playing games are obviously capable of creating stories. Uh, depending on the player, their ability to create stories, maybe their prime function, their secondary function, or just, you know, a byproduct of the game. But nevertheless, those stories appear, and quite, quite often those stories resonate with older, non-interactive narratives, like fantasy fiction, horror movies, post-apocalyptic novels, and so on. In order to analyze games as a well, story generating engine, I would like to highlight three interconnected questions. First, uh, what kind of stories does a particular game help us to create? What kind of stories does the game hinder? And what kind of roles we are assumed to take upon ourselves as heroes or villains, or as a protagonist, let's say, put it this way, of said stories? In order to make a few small steps to answering those extremely big questions, I approach tabletop RPGs as a type of proto-story, a system containing possibilities for creating a number of narrative, narratives through the process of instantiation. Specifically, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, specifically uh, they are provided by affordances of the game. And those affordances can be separated into two big interconnected groups, active affordances and interpretive affordances. Active affordances rely upon the interactivity and materiality of the game. They are potential ways for making actions in the primary, real world uh, that change an in-game situation. 
uttering a sentence with specific prescribed terms, rolling a die, uh, or somehow changing the uh, amount of in-game resor resources available for different entities are uh, realization of active affordances. Uh, and anytime we realize a specific active affordances, we create what I propose to call a situation. Any situation in tabletop RPGs can and most likely will be endowed with meaning by players, uh, participants of the game, collectively co-creating a virtual world of the game. And this will turn situation, a simple manipulation of in-game objects and resources through material or half material uh, means like our voice, into a meaningful event taking place in an imagined secondary world. Uh, and this process, uh, turning of situations into events, relies upon second type of in-game affordances, interpretive. Visual, textual, audio, and other cues provided by the game that can either support specific decoding of some situation or, or signal what situation players should create to encode a specific event. After rolling a dice, determine a result of an action called attack, realization of active objective affordances. Uh, I claim that the target of attack should deduct a specific number from the full amount of a resource, of a resource called hit points. But at the time, both me and other participants of the game are left with options uh, to answer a question. What exactly just happened in the secondary fictional world? Did uh, my character wounded the enemy? Did my character tired the enemy? Or did my character just reduce the abstract amount of points designating, uh, designating how my enemy is, how close my enemy is to being dead? Any answer to those questions uh, turns a situation into an event. And then by connecting a set of events with each other, a player instantiates a narrative. Of course, since interpretive affordances, unlike active affordances, are subjective, they rely upon cultural context, aesthetic preferences, pop culture literacy, and so on. Every situation, despite its objective status, produces unique events for every participant of the game, always. Uh, therefore, building up a unique personal narrative. However, game designers encode specific signs signaling the preferable approach to decoding the most important situations in the game. And this, coupled with the efforts of all the participants, especially uh, game masters, creates enough of an overlap between personal narrative to produce an illusion of a singular, singular virtual world and singular narrative, uh, sometimes called the shared imaginary space of TRPG. Relative ease of arriving at some shared narrative space uh, and some shared narrative at the experience uh, of other shared narratives signals what kind of stories and therefore what kind of ideas and ideologies are supported by a specific game in, big, uh, in general. Importantly, this scheme works both ways. We do not just passively decode situations into events and narratives. We come up with narratives utilizing uh, the interpretive affordances of the game, and then we look for ways to produce events necessary for those narratives to unfold. And therefore, we need to create specific situations. For example, if I want to play as, I don't know, a stubborn but nice half-elf barbarian, as I did, uh, I need to come up with events encoding that image of my character for other players. And then I need to create situations which would be then interpreted by me and players as part of this general narrative. <clears throat> Quite often, our ability to enjoy the game depends on whether it provides affordances to create a narrative we imagined uh, upon reading the game or hearing, uh, hearing about it from our friends, as usually is the case. Thus, even in games without a specific imagined, a specific imagined secondary world, we see an encoded secondary world, a supposed setting that would be easier to create using affordances provided by the game. This is the case with D&D, &D, where there are no one single uh, settings, there are numerous different settings. 
However, logic of those secondary worlds obviously cannot be all encompassed. Uh, they strongly favor some narratives by providing more affordances for the instantiation. For example, in order to grant specific players the affordances to create narratives resonating with traditional combat heavy fantasy, DD uh, had to encode their worlds as places where violence serves as viable and often only solution to any problem. Uh, Therefore, complicating any attempts to play as, for example, a diplomat. Uh, you still can play as a diplomat, but such an, let's say, oppositional playthrough strongly depends on the mutual agreement of all participants. In my presentation, I would like to speak about the way something similar happened with races and through them with encoded world of D&D. &D. Throughout its history, d and tended to increase the number of races available for play. This happens during the history of any particular edition, as well as throughout the history of d, &D in general, with the second edition featuring six core races, in basic player book third edition seven core races, fourth edition eight core races, and fifth edition nine core races in main player's hand. The, reason for this the reasons for this expansion are numerous and may differ depending on the edition and particular fantasy race in question, but by the time of fifth edition, obviously the main reason for the process is expectation that this process will continue. Players wait for new races to uh, appear along with new classes uh, and new, uh, new spells, new archetypes. This means that the encoded world of d, &D as well as pr races provided by it, should be created and in a way that would give uh, players, dungeon masters, and game designers affordances to later include new races without spending too much effort and stretching the credibility of already established settings. Uh, at the same time, this is complicated by the fact that new races, in case of D&D, have to adhere to traditional need of being uh, roughly humanoid in order to utilize standardized equipment and balanced. That is, uh, they should have similar, relatively similar usefulness in the fight. And this forces the developers to encode the world of D&D as what I would call, and I really... Now that I've come to the slide, I think this may be somewhat creepy term. Please excuse me. I come from a country with literal, literally no uh, decolonial colonial status. Uh, racial supermarket. A collection of potentially limitless amounts of specific options, non-dependent upon each other and providing clear affordances for including them in any party, in any configuration. Fictional worlds must be organized around the possibility to accommodate an, an indeterminately big number of different races, and those races should be different enough to make the choice meaningful, but similar, even standardized enough for the game to retain its current balance. But unlike classes, races traditionally served not only as a way to provide players with affordances to create their personal stories, they also encoded fictional world itself. And because of this, the very act of providing possibilities for later inclusion of limitless extra races bars the creation of some secondary worlds, despite the fact that those worlds may appear ideal for the entity. As a specific example, and then coming to a close, uh, I would like to point out that this approach of racial supermarket um, strips the entity of ability to include any meaningful metaphysics in the game. The very idea of race in the sense uh, of fantasy fiction uh, was popularized by work of Tolkien, obviously, where each particular race had a specific place in the world, representing different ontological statuses and fundamental qualities and so on. However, it would be hard to transfer such an approach and all the stories stemming from it to the logic of racial supermarket with its alienated, separated options and need for balance between individual maces, uh, members of different races in a very particular situation in combat. It is much easier to use racial supermarket to recreate a very romanticized and 
very problematic imagery, uh, fictional imagery of modern megapolis, supposedly filled with people come different from each other on the basis of cultural traits, but still similar, but still very similar to each other. Um, and the reason why this image of modern megapolis and therefore its wield reiteration in D&D uh, is problematic is obvious. But personally, and it, it has been sp spoken a lot about, including in uh, today's beautiful presentation. But personally, I want to focus on another fact. Uh, why is this? What is wrong with it, despite uh, the fact that uh, racial supermarket provides places for recreating the, uh, problematic stereotypes about specific race and, naturaliza and naturalizes the idea of race in the traditional biological and colonial sense? Uh, I want to focus on another problem. Uh, this approach encodes a very specific worldview and a very specific experience of the world around you. A worldview and experience available to the minority of modern people, I mean real people, that is of living in a world without any metaphysics, uh, with fundamentally one type of sentient beings, different from each other only by their upbringing and if you are a Nazi, by their biology, but that's it. And this uh, uh, image of the world uh, is naturalized by DND as only possible one. Naturalization of this worldview, whether we personally share it or not, uh, or, and whether we enjoy it or not, strips role-playing games of their potential as a tool of acculturation, as a way to remind us that even today many people, yes, yes well, last sentence, even today many people um, subjectively live in the world with metaphysics, live in the world where uh, there are different types of sentient beings and actually many different types of sentience itself. Uh, and, uh, so, and basically this serves as a way of further colonizing our imagination and portraying experience of Western, modern, middle-class people as only possible one, even, even worlds filled with magic, gods, and so on. Uh, I hope my English was sufficient for the talk, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you very much, Leonid. There is a lot to unpack there. I'm, I'm, I, I've, I have a lot of notes for the Q and A for you, and, and uh, because I, I, I feel like, like you're writing a book right now, which is amazing. <laughs> Our next uh, panelist um, will be. Uh, we're actually going to move into um, the experience of solo games, and this uh, presentation will be by Joao Leste. Uh, Joao, can you come uh, turn your camera on and, and microphone? And we'll, yes, get, we'll get started. There you are. Okay, wonderful. So um, uh, go ahead. If you have a, if you have a uh, set of slides, you may uh, share them now. Yes, so uh, before I begin, I'm going to ask you a favor. Yes. My internet connection is really bad today. So if at some time at some point I start freezing or something like this, I'd like to ask you to let me know, even if it's in the middle of the presentation, so I can turn my camera off or something like this. Yes, I, I will uh, attempt to maintain communication and we're a very understanding crowd here. So okay. <laughs> okay, give me a second. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. And uh, now we'll put you in presenter view. So, uh, good evening, everyone. First, I'd like to, to thank everyone for the opportunity to be here. And today I'll be presenting you an analysis on the experience with solo games. Can there be a truly solo playing experience? 
So now for the introduction. Before I actually start the presentation, I like to make a disclaimer. So I'm a rule book specialist and I'm currently researching accessibility for blind and visually impaired people in board games. So I generally conduct my research in regards to material issues in access to board games. However, based on discussion on the Ludus Magisterium study group with uh, which some previous colleagues are part of, I wanted to argue if it was possible to play a competitive solo game. So this presentation symbolizes an attempt of a new kind of research paradigm for me. So it's a little bit of a descent into madness, but I ask for some leeway and I hope you like it as much as I do. <laughs> so now for the presentation itself. So. Uh, according to the book, Building Blocks of Tabletop Game Design, a solo game is a game or game mode intended for play by a single player. So according to the authors, there are three main types of solo games. First, there's a goal-based solo game, much like Pandemic Solo version, in which you either reach a goal or you don't. The second time is a record-based game in which you are trying to achieve some kind of high score. And the third is an AI-based game in which you're interacting with a non-digital digital algorithm in order to play the game, much like in era medieval age. But again, much like era medieval age, some games can incorporate the characteristics of more than one of those types. However, they all have to have one thing in common, which is there is no interaction between players and game. So if we investigate player motivation, we could ask ourselves, why do pe people play games? So despite the more modern criticism of homo ludens, I, I think the key takeaway of the book is that playing games is an intrinsically social and cultural phenomenon. That means that in this context, uh, playing can never occur in a total social vacuum. After all, culture is by definition product of society. So I brought you one definition of culture, which is the way of life, especially the general customs and beliefs of a particular group of people at a particular time. So a better question would be why do people play games alone? So according to the essay, Solo Board Game, an, an analysis of player motivation, in which Dale Lord he, um, uh, reviewed more than 100 depositions for, from people who play games alone. He arrived to the conclusion that there are many motivating factors for people to play games alone, such as social reasons. For instance, you can have people to play with, but they don't play as much as you do, so you choose to sometimes play solo games. There are genre reasons. For instance, you may want to play solo games because you like their unique mechanics or the puzzle solving aspect that some of them have. And there is also play style reason. Perhaps you want time for yourself and playing games is your chosen activity. However, Online communities and platforms such as board game stats have transformed our notion of how we can interact with other people who play. So if we access their platform, there are many reasons they say we could be interested in using board game stats. The one that's interesting for today is, did you improve your score from last time? which is very tied to the record-based game's play style because you're comparing your stats now to your previous ones. So you're comparing um, your performance to previous performances. And moreover, they also compare the usage of board game stats itself to a semi-co-op activity because even though you with people you interact 
by logging your stats, you can interact with them um, like in a, in a different way because you're playing similar games and you're comparing your activity to theirs, even though you're not necessarily are playing together. So they encourage you to keep track of your scores and compare it with your peers, even if you aren't really playing together. And now let's start a thought experiment about solo games. So let's imagine we're going to play Railroad Inc. So it's a game in which each player gets an individual board and we play some dice and each player must draw the result of the dice in their boards. So let's imagine that two people are playing together and they roll those four dices. They will, they are going to draw the results however they want following the rules in their individual boards. Then they're going to play the second round, roll the dice and draw the next steps. However, there's something very interesting about this game, which is that there's no player interaction. Even if we're playing together, I only draw on my board and I have no impact on my opponent's board. So the only difference in terms of gameplay is the result of the dice between games. So I'm going to ask you, what is the difference between two people playing together, two people playing separately, but getting the same dice results in the same order, and the same person getting the same dice results in the same order, but five years later? So for starters, some of them are in the same place the scenario one. The second one, they are not in the same place. And for the third one, we can't really precise. So some of them are playing at the same time and some others are not. And some of them are playing against someone else and some of them are not. However, we must keep in mind that they are playing the exact same game because they're getting the exact same dice results in the exact same order. So what I'm going to propose to you is that actually scenario two could be described by two people playing together, just place separated. For instance, if they were talking on the phone or Discord or something like this, and they're telegraphing the dice results one to the other and using the same dice results. So even though they are not in the same place, being on the same place doesn't really matter. Conversely, I like to propose that we treat the third scenario as the same person playing, just time separated. And conversely, I would argue that playing at the same time is not necessarily uh, an intrinsic factor that impacts this game. And now the, the delve into madness is my proposition that aren't, aren't they playing against someone else? And before I continue, I like to do a little detour of how did I get here today? So it all began uh, during one of COVID-19's lockdowns when I bought two sets of 1,000-piece 1, puzzles because I was tired of looking at screens all day, to work, to study, to play, and I wanted to do things offline. So I started building the moon puzzle. And as any uh, puzzle maker will tell you, you should start with the borders because they are the easiest pieces to locate. And that's what I did. And I was placing an average of 10 pieces a day, and I thought this was a huge achievement which took me about four months to complete from beginning to end. When I began building the, the Earth puzzle, things were not really the same because since I began with the borders, I, I built it from outside within. And the last thing I did was build the, the, the center of the puzzle. But when I did it, I found out that this was the easier part, easiest part to do because the 
exactly a equal game difference. And since both puzzles use the same set of pieces, they're just colored differently, I could use the information I got from building the moon in order to build the earth. And that made me place um, an average of 50 pieces a day. And I thought it was it was common compared, compared to the, the moon puzzle, which was much harder for me. And it took me about three weeks to complete. But what does that really mean? So when I began building the moon puzzle, it took me a long time to finish it. But when I finished it, I could have an overview of the process. And this overview um, functioned as a, a kind of new information that I could use in order to do the second set of puzzles. And that leads me to one key aspect of playing games, which is the decision-making process of the player. So according to a model that I presented for my master's thesis, when we learn to play a game, we go through the apprehension process in which we learn what the rules of the game are, either by reading the rule book, watching a video tutorial, or someone teaching you then you have to process those rules in order to understand how the game is played. And finally, you compare this new information to your long-term memory, to your prior knowledge. And actually playing the game means that you're comparing the current game situations to the knowledge you built beforehand. That means that we could define a player as an individual person participating in a game and comparing current situations to their previous knowledge in order to make decisions. And when we think about the same person playing the exact, the exact same game, just time separated, we can arrive to the conclusion that their previous knowledge, which is an intrinsic part of being a player, is very different because they are time separated. So one of them has had more experiences and perhaps forgotten about some of them and learned new things, forgotten, <clears throat> forgotten some of them. So I'd like to pay homage to a very famous saying, which is, no person ever steps in the same river twice, but it's not the same reason, river and it's not the same person. So what I'm actually wanting to propose is that it's not the same person playing. It's two separate people playing because they are time separated. And when we go back to the three situations, what we arrive at is that playing against someone else, it's not really important to this game because there are six people who are playing the exact same game. Doesn't matter where, doesn't matter when, doesn't matter against whom, because they have access to the same exact gameplay, the same board, the same dice results, and the same options they have. They are just six different people. In that regard, I would argue that it's possible to play a single player game against yourself if you yourself could be understood as two people time separated. These are the bibliographical references that I mentioned, and those are the games that I mentioned throughout the presentation. And thank you. Thank you, Joao. I, 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 again, it's a lot of food for thought, and I've got some some other thoughts on this because this is a design space that um, you know questions. I, I, I th what it, what what it, what does it mean to be a player, right? Uh, so and it's not something near and dear to all of us. But we'll put that question again for later. And if you want want to um, uh, close your screen for a second. Sure. Um, our next uh, presenter, actually, we, we, have, we have at least um, uh, two of them, two of the three authors on the uh, panel right now. 
Uh, we, we, Edward Melser will will be presenting, but the uh, the actual piece is by Edward Melser, Andrew Dunn, and Bridget Ho. It's called the Macro Analysis of Entertainment and Serious Board Games from 1962 to 2022. This is actually really exciting, and uh, I'd like to say, like for you to take it away. Awesome! Thank you for the very nice introduction, Evan. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, hopefully everyone can see that okay and let me know if they can't. Um, okay, so yeah, this is a data-driven analysis of entertainment series board games over the last 60 years. I'm Mehdi Melser. I um, am an associate professor at UC Santa Cruz and director of the All Games Lab. And Andrew and Bridget are my master's students that have helped me uh, kind of do this very in-depth, large analysis, which has been a lot of fun. Um, and before I kind of jump further into it, I do actually want to just define what serious games are uh, for people that aren't as familiar with them necessarily, uh, which is basically, um, there's a lot of different definitions, but I think kind of a high level way to think about it is that they're games that are made to both entertain and address some additional characterizing goal. So that could be learning or health um, or, you know, an agenda, like political topic, anything like that. Um, so it's not just focusing on entertainment, but has this extra goal. We define them as serious games. Um, and so why do we necessarily care about serious games for, or serious board games? Um, well, board games in general have been showing a lot of growth uh, over the past, you know, couple decades. Um, and, and the popularity of them for serious contexts has kind of similarly seen that kind of growth. Um, they've gone a lot from being specifically oriented on war gaming and that kind of thing to covering a broad range of contexts, STEM, health, history, training, that kind of thing. Um, there's also a lot of uh, very limited research on serious board games and uh, their mechanics and design um, when compared to entertainment board games. There's really only a few examples we could take up that kind of related. Um, and so to better understand, you know, a large topic like this, sometimes this data-driven approach can be really useful to kind of see high-level trends, um, you know, uh, what types of things are emerging or declining over time, that kind of stuff. Um, and so we really had four kind of research questions when we were looking at this data, um, which was how do entertainment and serious board games compare with respect to user reviews and publication numbers? Um, are there any notable trends or categories uh, and mechanics uh, over the last 60 years between, you know, or for entertainment and serious board games? And how do they compare um, between categories and mechanics? And how are they similar? How are they different? Um, and then this is just kind of a personal interesting one that we threw on top as we were looking at the data is there's been a lot of conflicting reports about the impact of COVID-19 on the board games industry. I've seen both that sales went bonkers and was wonderful and also that it was terrible and really hard to publish things and that kind of stuff. Um, and so we wanna see a little bit like what the publication numbers would indicate. Um, and so the first thing when you're doing a fun large analysis like this is the data set collection. Um, and so we actually went to Board Game Geek and scraped all of the board games from it. Uh, we reran that again recently to get the most up-to-date data set we could um, using their API. Um, and overall we got 115,000 board games over 115,000 board games collected, that excludes expansions. Um, within our time frame of the last 60 years, 63 to 2022, um, it was not over 96,000. And specifically for serious board games, and I'll talk a little bit more how we define that in a second, uh, there's over 6,000, almost 7,000 uh, just for that number. Um, and so determining serious board games is actually not a trivial <laughs> task. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about limitations later with that, but um, we initially started by identifying categories that kind of be considered characterizing goals, like educational, environmental, math, political, history. Um, and specifically for math, there's actually a couple of different categories and history. There's a lot of different categories at different time periods. Um, so we actually kind of amalgamated all the games that had at least one of those categories together under a history topic. Um, but there isn't explicitly a serious games or a serious topic. Um, so we kind of looked at these uh, these categories that seem to be kind of, you know, categorizations of it. Um, and we looked at the top 10 board games for them. And uh, as you can kind of see down here with the Xs, uh, most of them were actually entertainment games. 
Uh, so we couldn't really break it down that way, just using straight up 14 uh, categories. Uh, so what we actually uh, decided to do was combine it with educational, which typically is exclusively or exclusively a series topic focus. Um, so instead of being just environmental, it would be all games that are environmental and educational, all games that were educational and math, um, and so forth and so forth. Uh, and then when we checked the top board, 10 board games again, that actually got us games that were pretty much all serious games. So it looked like that was a recent data set. We're sort of undersampling there, but at least we're safer on knowing that we're not including a bunch of entertainment games by accident. Um, and so this is sort of what the overall data set looked like after we broke it down that way. Um, so we had uh, uh, over 86,000 entertainment games, uh, over 6,000 uh, serious games, and almost 2,000 I actually don't have a category. Um, and within the serious games data set, the most was education. Uh, we had uh, quite a few thousand there. And then math, environmental, history, political. Um, and we looked at these three aspects when we were kind of analyzing the data for now, um, which was user ratings. And we looked both at the average user rating and the number of user ratings. Um, Board Game Geek has a ton of, of uh, definitions for that. So 10 is outstanding, one's the worst game you've ever played, um, and other numbers are somewhere in between. Um, and so we're kind of looking at that as a guideline for what those numbers mean. Um, they also have categories as being defined as grouping games based on like subjects or similar characteristics and mechanics being the functional aspects. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'll, I'll jump into the results. Um, so we looked at uh, top 10, and this is for average user ratings with a minimum of 50, rating, 50 ratings on it so that it wasn't just random games that you know had one or two rate, strong ratings and no one else. Um, and so you can kind of see, um, there's some interesting differences here. I'll talk about them more in a second, um, but also actually not a lot of games that I recognized uh, personally when I first looked at that was kind of interesting. Um, and then we looked at number of user ratings. Um, so games that were the most rated as a possible measure of popularity. Um, and that we actually saw, I at least see a lot more that I recognize, Japan, Carcassonne, Pandemic, uh, Morals, Wingspan, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, so some interesting observations with this. Um, entertainment, entertainment games overall appear to have these higher user ratings um, than serious games. And that's actually aligned with past work that has looked at this and, and also seen that with just educational board games. So it seems to continue to be the case here. Um, there also seems to be a potential recency bias in average user ratings, which is interesting. So um, looking at the average publication year of just those top five, uh, for average user ratings versus number, uh, there's actually a significant difference. Uh, average user ratings are a lot more recent for 2018 on average versus like 2012 for the number. Um, and then the last thing that's kind of interesting is that maybe these are letting us look at uh, board game recommendations or the data in kind of different ways. So maybe average user ratings might be getting a little bit more at these hidden gems if you appropriately threshold it uh, with enough ratings on it. Um, whereas the number of user ratings maybe is identifying more of the classic board games that are, you know, really famous and have been around for a while, that kind of thing. Um, and so we also then started to look at publications uh, over time um, for the different board games. So this is sort of what it looks like um, for all the board games in this time span. Um, I'll talk more about this in a second because it's pretty interesting. Um, and uh, here it is when you plot entertainment versus serious games over the same 60 year time span. Um, and you can see that entertainment games have had quite a significant amount more growth than uh, serious. Um, but one thing to keep a uh, note of is that when you plot them together like this, because they're significantly less than the entertainment in the serious space, um, it kind of flattens it out. Uh, so if you actually just put them side by side and look at the distribution over time, uh, you can see that they do actually have relatively similar growth patterns, um, although Sirius is a little weaker. And so uh, that's another kind of interesting one is that on the whole, Sirius board game growth is pretty limited or at or potentially uh, there's just been really explosive entertainment board game growth over the last 60 years, which is kind of cool to see. Um, 
though there is this really notable point of growth for serious board games in the early 2000s, which is really interesting because that aligns a lot with the digital serious games trend when things like the serious game initiative were founded. Um, you know, Games for Health came around in like 2006. Um, and so this time period, there's a pretty huge jump uh, in serious board games, which is kind of cool to see. And you can we can see this in the past work as well, where they kind of chart out, uh, you know, the publication of serious games in academia and industry, and they have similar trends of really increasing once you hit the 2000s. Um, another interesting observation, and this is what I was kind of hinting at earlier, is that COVID-19 had a pretty noticeable impact on the board game community as a whole. Uh, so both of these graphs, serious and entertainment, right at 2019 is the highest point, and then it continues to go down year after year. Um, so it seems like it's still been in the uh, board game community still been impacted. It has been impacted and is still impacted today, uh, which is kind of interesting to to think about um, and what may still be the cause. Um, we then broke it down, and we can kind of break down the serious category as a whole into these different subcategories I identified earlier. So educational, environmental, history, math, political, um, and you can kind of see that again and educational flattens it all out. So if you just look at them side by side, uh, you can kind of look at it and start to see some interesting trends. Um, and, the, and the one really interesting takeaway I wanted to mention today is that the all the other categories decline over time, especially when we hit like 2019. Um, but the only one that doesn't really uh, is, is uh, environmental games. Um, and that's kind of interesting that we kind of see this growth of it that aligns with a lot of the police, uh, increased political and cultural focus in the late 80s, early 90s of environmentalism, um, and and sort of aligns with this increase in environmental themes in video games, the digital side as well, from the early 90s to today. So kind of see similar trends in the board game space, which is interesting. Um, we also looked at frequency and popularity of categories and mechanics. Uh, we start. I'll start with my categories. Um, and these are just some pretty word clouds that kind of give you a high level view of what are the most popular categories over the 60 year span as a whole. Um, but we can also break that down by time period. So these are different. Uh, each one's a five year chunk uh, of time. And these show you um, each time period. They're colored based on the higher the frequency in that time period. So uh, if it's if it occurs a lot, in that time period, that five-year time period, it'll be darker um, and it'll be lighter if it doesn't. Um, and so we also excluded the educational category just because all educational is in serious. Um, and then we just have one black line across the top. So that would make the results hard to read. Um, so we just get rid of that. Um, and yeah, there's some kind of interesting trends I think uh, you might already be able to see uh, with some of these that I'll talk about a little more. Um, we can also do the same thing by breaking down the subcategories. So here's some kind of high level 60 year overviews of, of educational games, political, environmental, math, uh, and history for, uh, for series board games. Um, and uh, let me make sure there's no issue. Oh, sorry. Um, and yeah, so uh, this is also uh, just looking at that over time. Um, and just some quick observations there. Um, there's some really interesting things like the pervasiveness of card games. So uh, they've been there all the time, but they actually continue to get stronger and stronger over time, which makes sense because cards are really flexible in the mechanics and the way you can use them. Um, children games is kind of different where entertainment has decreased over time, which kind of makes sense of, I think there's been much more of a focus on adult games, uh, whereas Sirius has, um, pretty much continually stayed focused on, on uh, or had a lot of games focused on children's games, which also makes sense. Um, there's also a notable lack of theming categories in serious games. So things like fantasy, science fiction, miniatures, print and play, even time periods like uh, ancient medieval world war, not in there, uh, which is very interesting to see that maybe there could be more theming work done uh, in the serious board game space. Um, and similarly, there is, um, not a lot of war games showing up, which surprised me because that was the number one thing I expected to see very strongly in serious games. But it actually turns out that when you break it down by subcategory, it does appear strongly in history, um, which makes a lot of sense and somewhat in political, 
uh, but not in other topics, uh, which actually makes it not as frequent as you would expect in a serious game space. So board games actually maybe don't make it as big of a chunk as uh, at least I had initially assumed and maybe many others do. Um, we also looked at frequency, same thing for entertainment versus serious mechanics and over time. Um, we also looked at that for different subcategories. Um, and again, over time. And there's some kind of interesting trends there. Decline is roll and spin move. Um, so both entertainment and serious games seem to have that particular mechanic decline. I think that makes sense as that tends to be a more uh, simple long-term mechanic that's been around a long time and maybe people are moving away from that a little bit. Um, there's also just kind of limited board game game board design and movement design in serious games, which is kind of interesting. Um, it's just sort of overall the diversity of mechanics utilized in serious board games seems to be less than entertainment board games, which, which is interesting and means there's a lot more potential in the serious board game space. Um, so yeah, just to kind of summarize some key takeaways, uh, looking at different aspects of uh, user ratings can result in different kinds of board game recommendations, or at least potentially could. Um, the overall, the serious board games probably haven't explored the same breadth of design as entertainment board games. Uh, so COVID-19 has had a pretty significant impact, and this data-driven approach as a whole can be pretty useful to understand, uh, you know, these long-term trends, emerging uh, categories, mechanics, that kind of stuff. Um, there's a couple of limitations. So serious doesn't necessarily equal educational. Uh, so there's some sampling bias that we could be introduced there. Uh, recent board games have less time to be cataloged on board game geeks. So we might be missing some more recent ones. Um, we're only looking at one website, which means we're missing a lot of academic and research board games because those aren't cataloged as much at board game geek. Um, publicly accessible, uh, it's publicly accessible, modifiable user generated data there, um, which means it can have holes or be inaccurate. So, for example, uh, board game geek doesn't include solitaire puzzle games. I've tried to submit things like uh, the code programming game. Um, and that's been rejected before. Um, so that probably has a stronger adverse effect on serious board games compared to entertainment board games uh, if it's those types of categories being excluded. Um, and thank you, that's, that's pretty much everything, um, but I'd love to hear your questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eddie. Thank you also, Bridget, for, for this excellent research and I am uh, quite, um, I, I, I'm I'm stewing on the fact that you chose very large dice rather than large cards there as, as that um, graphic, but uh, we'll we'll get into that later. Um, I'm moving on. I, again, I, I'm I'm loading everything into Q and A so people stay and actually participate. <laughs> um, our next uh, presenter. Uh, uh, again, the, the research is by Greg Loring Albright and Jason Perez, and the, and the presenter will be Greg Loring Albright. Um, and this is a paper, it looks like, on player and character relationships. So take it away, Greg. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm on the last slide. What am I doing? There we go. Nope. Sorry, hold on. Oh, yay. Well, that was the shortest one ever. It's over. Amazing. I, I look I feel forward like I to all of your I questions. Yeah. Like, what was your presentation? <laughs> um, okay. Okay. I'm here for real. Apologies. Uh, let me start my timer and I will begin the presentation for real uh, after that very auspicious opening. Okay. Thank you all for attending this, this panel and uh, special thanks to the organizers of this session for all your, your hard volunteer work. It is appreciated. Um, I'm presenting, as, as Evan said, work that myself and Jason, our earlier speaker, are doing. Um, and the presentation is called The People at Play, Troubling Straightforward Player Character Relationships. Uh, that troubling is a verb, not, not a, an adjective. I realize I made a sort of confusing subtitle. Um, Okay, so let's talk about it. So Jason and I are co-designing a board game adaptation of Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. Um, for those of you who are not aware, which hopefully isn't many of you, uh, this is a landmark pedagogical work, a sort of critical approach to US history that's also very approachable. Uh, it's used in schools across the country. Uh, it has its own sort of body of, of reactionary criticism against it, but, but regardless, it's an important book. Um, we are we were were contacted by the Tessa Collective, which is an activist board gaming publisher, 
to make a board game adaptation of this, they had in turn been contacted by the Zinn estate. Um, and so we started designing this game and in the process of doing it, we came to this realization about uh, representing players in a game that is sort of so broadly scoped. And so uh, this is kind of my, my core takeaway if you want the, uh, you know, go get dinner right now version of the presentation is basically uh, you don't need to have a player be a singular avatar in a game. Uh, but let's dig into that assertion a little more. So I'll talk about some of the literature and theory behind connecting players and their in-game people, their in-game characters. I'll talk about Howard Zinn's conception of the people, the titular people. Uh, I'll go through a little bit of our design work and kind of our thoughts in the case study portion, and then I will conclude. So um, number one, players and characters, as, as all of us likely are aware, uh, the, the struggle is real when it comes to finding images of board games that are uh, rights free and also are not just Monopoly. So here's Monopoly. Um, and I, I actually, I like this image a lot because it makes my point a little bit, right? When you play Monopoly, you are probably not playing Monopoly as a dog realtor. Maybe you are, but, but it seems doubtful. So uh, you are not always who you are in a game, right? Uh, the player position within the game fiction is sort of the, the common understanding here. Uh, this differs a little bit in representational versus non-representational games. We've been talking in the Discord a lot about chess, a lot of, a lot of chess hate, a lot of chess love. Um, but you're not really, I, at least I think I'm not a chess you know, expert. I don't think there's a lot of communities of chess players who are like, yeah, I'm the king when I play chess, because if I die, the game is over. Um, Nonetheless, this, this is often assumed, right, that especially in a contemporary board game hobby where there are lots of games with themes and representational work going on, there's like, okay, who are you, right? And I, I make this sort of uh, assumption, I, I'm going to reference this shut up and sit down video from 20, nope, I didn't put the year, it's on the reference slide. Uh, they, they made a video about how to teach board games, and they said the three questions you need to answer about any game when you're teaching it are, who are we, how do we win, and why will this be fun? And that first question, who are we, just takes this assumption at face value. So this is a standard thing to think about in hobby gaming. Um, I have X-Wing here uh, to shamelessly plug. I wrote a piece for Analog Game Studies in 2017, kind of interrogating this when it comes to the Star Wars X-Wing miniatures game of like, who are you in this game where it seems like you're a space fighter pilot, but actually maybe you're not. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So, um, so that's sort of like, I, I've been, run very, very quickly through all this literature. Um, and I'm happy to hear more citations. I'm early in this process. Um, of course, there's a whole body of literature around avatars and video games that I didn't talk about, but the point is hopefully made clear, right? You as a player of a game often take on a singular personality within the game. That's generally a safe assumption to make, but there are plenty of times where it's not. Okay. Um, Got to find my notes. So uh, this is Howard Zinn uh, with an awesome strike poster behind him. And Howard Zinn, of course, wrote People's History of the United States. And this game, or that book, uh, contains this sort of central conception of the people versus the establishment. Uh, shouts out to Jason, who found this great quote very early in the book. This is kind of a touchstone for the book itself and for us in our game design. Uh, Zinn's work is disrespectful of governments and respectful of people's movements of resistance. So Zinn's people, uh, in opposition to the establishment, um, are this kind of monolithic force, right? This, this first bullet point here, this quote about doing history from the bottom up, this is like the most common Zinn quote you see. Um, and, and he's, right, he's writing a history not of presidents and generals and CEOs, but rather of the people at the bottom who have been put at the bottom. It is a totalizing rhetoric, which is to say that like, for Zinn, you know, he unearths historical detail about these people, but he also sort of says like, look, the, the, the plight of an enslaved person in the 1600s and the plight of someone participating in the Stonewall riot in the 1960s are, uh, I'll overstate it, the same, right? What he's really saying is they are similar, they are positioned against power in the same way, but it does this sort of sanding off of there's the people and there's the establishment. Uh, this, this kind of move uh, continues uh, past Zinn's death uh, into the contemporary moment. Garibaldo, in 2014, writes about the popular turn in protest movements, which uh, connects to like 
right-wing populism and nationalism that I don't have time to dig into, but this idea that protest movements grasp onto this notion of the people to make their rhetorical points. The classic example here in the US, at least, is the Occupy movement saying, we are the 99%, right? It's a similar monolithic state. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, this, is, this is what Zinn's book is doing at, at this level of conflict, right? The people are arrayed in a sort of totality against the establishment. Uh, okay, so players and characters, very briefly. Zinn's theories, very briefly. Part three, I'm going to bring them together. Uh, and I'm, I went quickly through that other stuff so I could spend some time here. Oh, I'm doing great on time. I'll slow down a little bit. Uh, so uh, Jason and I, as, as we mentioned, are designing a game together. This is an image from our latest design retreat. And um, we are going to, we, we will use our design reflections to unite the concepts of the people and this notion of the player character to interrogate the notion of the singular player character avatar relationship and also hopefully provide some ideas for future game designers to, to think through ways to, to, to tangle with these issues. So uh, we're not making Pandemic. Uh, we are making a cooperative board game where all the players win or lose together. It's a game that addresses the entirety of the book. This was part of our brief and publisher. And it's designed to be a relatively accessible board game, although uh, as, as a lot of folks, especially in panel one noted, uh, what, what hobby gamers and game designers think is an accessible board game and what gamers think of as an accessible board game may be different. So uh, this is what we're doing. And I put pandemic here because it's a touchstone that we keep coming back to. We love saying, how did pandemic solve this problem? And should we use that solution? Even if we don't, we like to think about what this very successful game uh, that's, that's in a similar space that we are working in did. So uh, how do you go about playing the people, right? I've already sort of pointed out these sort of problematic issues with this, this unified vision that spans, you know, 500 plus years of history. Um, and, and how do you make that playable? Pardon me, I'm going to switch uh, pages on my notes. And so the first thing that, that we thought about was, um, you know, we, we we kind of embraced the player character avatar model. And we said, okay, the players are gonna be on the board. At one point we had a map of the United States and we had a pawn and we said, this pawn is gonna be you. And we said, who, who are you gonna be? And so from top left going clockwise, we said, you could be adventurers. You could be Indiana Jones types and bring some, we were like, let's bring some excitement and some action to the history. Um, we said, you could be historians. And we in, were thinking about modeling this rhetoric of like balancing archival research with actually talking to people in the places. Uh, we said, you could be school kids learning history and unlearning propaganda, or you could be time travelers going through the eras that the book addresses and, and making connections. Um, but ultimately, we didn't land on any of that. Um, we wanted to center the history. Well, we sort of came to this, this conclusion that I'm talking about here in two ways. The first one, we, we just didn't like any of these. We kind of tested them out and played around with them. And there's like problems with all of them for various, various reasons that I won't get into. But the other reason was we said, you know what, this is supposed to be a game about Zinn's work and about the history that undergirds it. So we said, uh, let's let's decenter the player character. And in decentering the player character, we came to this place of, of this kind of unpacking that I'm about to do on the next slide, where we said, you don't have to be a singular entity within a game for the game to work and make sense. The game, as we conceptualize it now, and this is an old uh, gameplay diagram, so don't get too excited about it. Um, is a rummy type game. So the players are going to play these cards that are like individual moments or movements or things from history, and they play them to a shared central area. And that's where the gameplay occurs. And you don't have a, an avatar pawn to move around that area. You just lay cards out of your hand. We have built in a little bit of player asymmetry where you have certain cards that work better for you, and we may theme them in some way or another. But right now, it's not, uh, that's not you. That's you, the player, but it's not you within the game fiction. The game fiction is very loose and it's designed to sort of foreground these history cards so that players can think about and learn about, you know, what is actually going on in the in the Zin book. Um, let's check my notes. Yes, cool. So takeaway. So we, we came to this place where we said, it's okay if you're not a, a singular entity. And then we said, actually, per this first bullet point, it's really good that you're not a singular entity in this game. This is a game about the, the kind of core Zin thing, right? Is that 
uh, you know, a general, a president, et cetera, has lots of agency, lots of ways to make choices and lots of power. And it's easy for games to model people who can make choices and have lots of power. But part of the, the Zen model of the people is that uh, change occurs via lots of small, powerless people gathering together and pointing their power in one direction. And so it's this non-individualistic understanding that there's not a hero unit in our game, just as there's not a hero in Zin's book. Um, so we, we encourage uh, other game designers to not take on this, this normative uh, uh, assertion that like, okay, you know, who are you? What are you doing? How do you win the game, right? Who are you can actually have a, a bigger question and it doesn't need to be uh, fictionally sound, right? Like it doesn't need to make sense within the fiction of the game for it to work within the game as a game. Uh, I also... Uh, We'll, we'll conclude by saying, you know, we, we encourage designers to think about the ways that they are going to impact theory and vice versa, theorists to do their own design and look to design for, for new insights. We wouldn't have stumbled upon this sort of model of the, the non-unitary subject, this kind of post-enlightenment model, without having to design a game. You know, we would have said, sure, we'll do the historian model. We love it. We're happy. We'll write the paper. But uh, actually digging into the game design opened up this new this new vision to us. Here are my citations. The Shut Up and Sit Down video was from 2020. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you, Greg. And thank you, Jason and Absentia, uh, for, for uh, this. Again, uh, we're all playtest ready here and can supply ourselves for, you know, any experimental uh, you know, part of your design. Building a digital building a digital mod is on my to do list, so I will drop it in the uh, the self promo. Yeah. In like okay. you know, ideally a month, probably more like two months, but you know how life goes. The Discord lives on, so we're we're happy to to see that later on. Our final uh, paper of the conference is uh, by Malay uh, Damelia, and uh, we look forward to um you know this general paper on on game design analysis so malay yeah am i audible i can hear Hello. you loud and clear all right thank you so much and uh since tonight i do not have my physical presence uh, at this symposium i'm going to introduce myself on screen and in the presentation um, I am Malay. Uh, I my background is I, I am an electrical engineer. Then I segued into interaction design, human computer interaction, uh, then to design researcher, and now I research board games. I have been uh, playing board games since uh, since since my childhood, um, and currently I'm pursuing a PhD at IDC School of Design in IIT Bombay in India, uh, where I am trying to develop a design theory of player experiences in abstract board games. Uh, and I'm supervised by Professor Girish. Um, right. And on today, today on this fine uh, Friday morning here in India, uh, I'm going to present design in the shape of gameplay. Uh, it is essentially a methodological discourse. Um, I will also take this opportunity to thank the organizers for uh, having this uh, board game conference. Uh, I'm quite excited about it. Uh, and it is my first board game conference. So I'm really enthused uh, by the idea of it. So thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the impossibility of impossibility of capturing experiences in board games, the importance of gameplay to reduce this impossibility, and then propose events as a phenomenological state and a unit of gameplay. I also position events as a way to analyze experiences from a design perspective. Uh, players undergo multitude of experiences, emotions and affects when they play games. Of the many characteristics of these experiences, the second order design nature of experiences is crucial for design researchers and game designers. The second order nature of experiences is important because game designers have to design the experience without having a complete control over them. They can, they can only design these experiences indirectly. 
they are in these experiences are emergent in nature uh, designers can only design the rules mechanics of the game but the experiences emerge out when players play the game thus for uh, game design research it becomes important to study how these experiences are created in relation to the rules of these games so the important question for design research in board games is how would one study player experiences in board games from a design perspective um conventionally game design research has been a study about what is designable that is rules mechanics balancing uh, etc etc uh, this approach has given us fantastic tools knowledges and perspectives uh, to design uh, uh, that help designers to design games uh, some po very popular examples are the typologies by uh, professor r said the 400 uh, game elements project the game ontology project building blocks of tabletop games uh, and so forth and this has been uh, a dominant view uh, because it comes from a technical rational view of design research that uh, designer seeks the solution with tools and knowledge at hand uh, within this view the experiences that a designer intends to create are problematized and these experiences uh, are something to be solved for using available tools and hence in 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 such a uh, situation uh, design research is uh, design research is given responsibility to create uh, create tools knowledges which help designers seek that solution uh, many scholars argue that design research should focus on designers their processes and their created products when such a technical rational view of design is applied to game design it raises several question usually this technical rational approach works with many artificial products uh, but in games it creates some very very interesting questions uh, some of them are what is the product when it comes to games is it the game or is it the experience if it is the experience is it something that can be solved if it cannot be solved should experience be removed from the domain of game design altogether which brings us to the second view point that it is very pertinent uh, it is very pertinent uh, to game design research uh, and it says that game design research should study aesthetics and experiences william and alexander argue that design research in game should takes uh, should take aesthetics based approach as experiences are the ultimate ends of games many scholars like cowley and their colleagues and yarvinen they study uh, who study experiences in games have urged design research scholars to bridge the gaps between the experiences and rule systems that uh, they create that create them uh, william and alexander wonderfully articulate using stoltermans argument that design research needs to focus on the ultimate particular means to the ultimate particular ends here ends are the experiences and gameplay aesthetics if experiences are the ends what would be the means to achieve these ends uh, this question makes us think about the relations between rules and the experiences of players we argue that design research should focus and theorize the relations between rules and ex player experiences however howell and stevens they argue that analyzing uh experiences from a design perspective has fundamental epistemological issues while experiences are an emergent instance of the rule set designers and designers uh, design researchers have to arrive at the design of the game in order to create useful knowledge in in the case of board games it is uh, in in case of board games this useful knowledge is in the terms of the design of rules moreover experiences are in situ uh in moment idiopathic inner pristine in nature how does one study experiences uh, in relation to the rules that generate such uh, experiences just a reminder uh, game design needs to focus on the relations between the rules and uh, the experiences it creates while the issues are epistemological we attempt the, to reduce this gap by developing a design research method to identify these relations um uh, we conducted a small experiment uh, with simple games like jenga scrabble ludo and chinese checkers we asked players to play the game and then change one rule of the game so as to reduce fun uh, 
uh, yes, to reduce fun, this stimulus makes the play players uh, make uh, make players think of their experiences in terms of rules. They put them in a causal frame of sorts, uh, uh, and and they make them they make uh, they are forced uh, uh, they are made to uh, create relations between the rule sets and the uh, experiences that they have they want to change. Some of the interesting uh, results of uh, uh, sorry, yeah. Some of the interesting results of this uh, uh, experiment uh, are uh, in in the game of Jenga. I chose this game Jenga to uh, as, as an example here because uh, it, it's one of the simplest game, and I'm assuming that everyone would know. Um, players changed the Jenga rule to play uh, to the following. Players can only remove the block in the center of each layer. So, um, which suddenly reduces the fun because uh, you are, I mean, uh, players cannot, do not have the agency to choose the block, the tower, they, they're meant, they're, their thought process was, uh, I derive fun or I find the tower swaying uh, 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 more interesting. And that is why I, I should change the rule which would make towers sway less. Um, so they focused on a particular type of uh, event, which we call as events, uh, and then tried to derive rules what created those events. So the result of this experiment was we conceptualized events as a unit of gameplay. Now these events have phenom uh, they have phenomenological properties because it contains the information of the rules of the game, uh, players and their experiences. Uh, they contain a bunch of relations between the ludic structure and the experiences uh, uh, that uh, that are created out of these structures. So, uh, it, continuing the same example, the Jen Jenga tower swaying and the feeling of anticipation would, was reduced by changing that one rule set uh, of uh, uh, by changing that one rule set where players can only remove blocks from the center of any layer. Uh, like uh, so, now that we know that unit uh, events can be seen as the fundamental unit of gameplay, um, we conceptualize gameplay as a series of events. Uh, to understand the quality of qualities of these events, we needed experience profiles of each game. So, if we can consider, so this might be a bit structuralist approach, but uh, we can we can consider gameplay as a sequence of events, like somewhat like hero's journey, but not a universal profile, a uh, universal arc uh, using, uh, I mean, that a player has, a player goes through that, but uh, it is the general, it is the general uh, arc within a game that a player, players, players can possibly go to. Uh, to understand these qualities of events, we needed, that is why we needed these experience profiles of the games. Uh, experience, but there is again a problem. Experiences are in moment, they are in situ, contextual, and inner pristine. Um, so the idea was to capture this experience profile. So we thought, uh, let's go with think aloud protocols. The strength of this uh, method is uh, experiences can be captured in moment and in situ in in context. But like we all know, in board game strategies are revealed when we think aloud. And it becomes too tasking because a player not, un not only has to work through the game, but also has to verbalize their uh, feelings, emotions, and decisions. Second idea was to do the retrospective protocols. After, the, after they have played the game, we show the video, and they are asked to reconstruct uh, these um, uh, their moments and their experiences. So the drawback of this, uh, uh, the drawback of these methods are experiences can be captured in moment, uh, but strategies are uh, but strategies are not revealed and they do not become too tasking while playing the game so uh, we uh, we we say we used experience sampling protocol based on chiksentmihai's idea of experience experience sampling uh, here researcher played the game with play, uh, with with the participant and either of the players can trigger a sample collection whenever they experienced fun uh, or they are too bored uh, players then reconstruct their experience sample by sample uh, in a separate inter uh, in a separate discussion session. This protocol was applied to six games, ranging 
uh, from abstracts. Uh, most of them are ab uh, all of them are abstract strategy games. Uh, some of them are perfect information. Some of them are perfect imperfect information, and some of them uh, have randomness uh, in ingrained in it, like Azul and Patchwork. Uh, in Santor Sa Santorini Squadro and Pylos would be considered as pure abstract strategy. Battleship is the information asymmetric uh, game that we chose. So uh, when we analyzed those experience samples um, through inductive coding, we found several 64, we found 64 events uh, of which I'm going to uh, exemplify through one such event. And that event is called formulation of hypotheses. So we found that players formulate hypotheses at the beginning of the game and during the game, their hypotheses keep changing. So this hypothesis can be about the gameplay, about their game plan, about possible player actions, and this hypothesis can be can be with respect to self or opponent or opponent's game plan. Now to articulate this formulation of hypothesis, uh, this these hypotheses can be different with different types of games. Uh, it is not in every kind of uh, in in all kinds of abstract strategy games, uh, players do formulate hypotheses. Uh, and this is the kind of relations which we which we try to capture through this particular method. Method. It not only relates to the rule set; it also relates to the players. Now, the question to articulate question I would like to bring back in is why is a formulation of hypothesis fun, or what are the experiences associated with this particular event? <clears throat> so, first of all, formulation of hypothesis it follows with testable outcomes during the gameplay. <laughs> Sorry, players modify hypotheses according to uh, opponent's uh, opponent's hypothesis. In this way, gameplay can be seen as an enmeshment of uh, multiple hypotheses by different players. Uh, and in the end, more accurate hypotheses wins. Yet the true understanding of the system still remains. Uh, only the better. I mean, it put game puts all the hypotheses on a spectrum, whichever is truer or al aligns most with the system, that uh, strategy wins. And yeah, uh, but it is not, it, it does not uh, foolproof a strategy because, and, and that is where game creates ambiguity. So formation, the fun of formulating hypotheses remains because of the ambiguity created by the game. Now, there are more such events like formulation of game plan, estimation of opponent skills, setting goals, estimation of action plans, uh, formulation of working principle and so forth. There are such 64, uh, 64 such events of which uh, we are analyzing currently. Uh, on, I am listing six of them at the moment. Um, events can possibly explain experiences. So we know higher order theories of player experiences <clears throat> Uh, on, 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 on experiences and fun like Bogost's, re, uh, Bogost's theory of reframing, Coaster's fun, uh, theory of fun as learning, they can, be, they can be explained through these events. How does a player learn? When does it stop becoming, <clears throat> when does it stop becoming fun? Uh, how does game help players reframe a, a situation? What kind of situations are reframed and so forth? So through these uh, events that contain bunch of relations, uh, we can possibly explain these experiences. And these events can, uh, uh, these events can um, uh, be used to conduct design analysis of these experiences. And it can, it, we argue that it is a possible ultimate particular means uh, to the ultimate particular ends of player experiences. Uh, it, can, it can help in uh, furthering the formal design analysis of gameplay and in return and, and gradually through subsequent testing of this, a, a lot of these events, it can be employed to play testing sessions. Thank you for listening. Uh, I'm sorry because I'm sorry if I was a bit jittery because I'm kind of sleep deprived. It's 5 a.m. in the morning at India, in India. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Malay. And uh, can I summon as many people, um, you know, to the panel? I, I guess uh, you don't have to turn on your, your video and audio, just you can when you're ready to comment. Um, 
So I want to thank all of our pre presenters for um, for admirably treating the topic today. Um, I guess um, I have several questions that, that can be posed as well as uh, ones that will be in the Q&A. So just to give people a few more minutes to put questions in the Q&A, I can go through my list, uh, just starting in the order of what I have. Uh, for Leonid Moj Mojis, uh, I, I am intrigued by um, not, not only, you know, bracketing things around the proto story as mechanics and as affordances, but what you bracket out uh, in Marcus Montala's Invisible Roles of, uh, Rules of Role Playing, uh, he classifies between diegetic, endogenous, and exogenous rules. Now, if you, I was looking at your your classification of the two different types of RPG statements. And so what, we, what you've got is a diegetic statement, right? Like here's what, you know, you um, become a god or something like that. And, and, and an endogenous, which is I roll a six and I hit. But then there's the exogenous, which is can you pass the Doritos? Or can you, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, cook, uh, you know, I don't consent to that fiction. Um, a whole, there's a whole host of other statements right there. Uh, so that, that that's question number one, which is, uh, is, is the game, is the conception of the game kind of uh, lopsided if we cut out that other dimension of play, which is that we are just humans talking um, at a very meta level or even at a very basic level around the table, um, not in the game or about the game at all, um, necessarily. And then the other question is, uh, again, for you to define what you mean by metaphysics. Uh, and and how how then the metaphysical reality is is sort of denied through this uh, racial supermarket classification system. So we'll we'll start there. Okay, uh, I will briefly answer the first question. Uh, basically, I think, uh, especially in case of my presentation, it was about. Uh, you know, um, limitation of what I can squeeze into 15, 15 minutes. Basically, of course, uh, the group dynamics, the different rules, the different cultures of rules, uh, and so on is extremely important, maybe more important than anything else. Uh, but uh, since uh, I study primary, the game texts of games basically rule books and what i encoded in them i just had to choose what to focus on uh, and i understand that this is uh, this is limits my research obviously and well well to be honest i have a bit of a social anxiety so it's hard for me to conduct uh, informed sociological research anyway so <laughs> but i would be happy for someone to join me uh, um uh, in uh, actually includes an analysis of what exactly and how exactly players engage with rules um as provided by rulebook uh oh wow so i need to define metaphysics in one minute uh, uh okay um the unfortunate thing is that your entire argument hinges on it. So that, that's yes, why I'm yes, ve very yes. interested. Um, I, in this specific instance, I would like to define a metaphysical side of the world as a sort of ontological doubling of the physical world, which um, always have to coexist with physical uh, side of the world and which influence physical side of the world, but it is never a unique um, force uh, that uh, influence or being influenced. Um, for example, uh, in, I don't know, oh, uh, in uh, traditional and, you know, medieval Christianity, uh, if a person sin, 
there are material reasons for that, like, I don't know, physical attraction, greed, uh, and so on. And there are doubling of those reasons because he sinned because devil told him to do so, or it was a God's plan. And there always were tensions between them. So we could not say that, for example, we could not say that there are three material physical reasons. We, uh, both we and people of the time, understood that those reasons were um, on different level, uh, that they were ontologically fundamentally different from each other. But at the same time, they were real. And uh, this is precisely the thing we do not see in uh, D&D, because uh, uh, it is very characteristic for me, because in a great talk uh, by uh, Emma French today, uh, she uh, absolutely correctly uh, called um, difference between orcs and elves and different races biological. Uh, despite the fact that, I mean, we couldn't, uh, it would not be entirely correct, at least diagetically, diagetically, sorry, to call difference between elves and orcs biological in case of Tolkien, uh, because there are no biology, uh, like... <laughs> this side of the world does not exist. Uh, may, again, this may be problematic in itself. Uh, I'm not, you know, um, champion in the good old days of uh, magic and so on, but uh, the fact remains. Uh, I hope I clarified uh, my point. The, the, there's a sort of essentialism in this kind of mechanical activation of race that denies ontological um you know ambiguity right and and, and we, we, from which we 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 find most religious experience i can i can understand yeah right okay. which you find most religious experience and which strongly um accompanies the idea uh, of non-human people like original elves or genes or um, i don't know kami in japanese in shinto and so on and and that that would that I think is also really appropriate in your title about the disenchantment, right? Which which is which is to say this is in in alignment with you know Michael Saylor's kind of reenchantment of the world. But the the problem is is we re disenchanted everything through Dungeons and Dragons and other uh, similar vehicles again through mechanics and other things. I get it. I get it. All right, I'm going to move on to Joao. Um, uh, I think my 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 question uh, for you. Uh, Joao, if, if you're able to respond, is uh, what is a player? And uh, and second of all, then, um, how do we define a player um, who is, is uh, you know, playing against a different version of themselves, or rather, rather, you know, is, is, is that is that your argument that we have multiple selves and we're sort of multiplying um our own engagement with them or is that that um there is some other operation happening there so i guess the first question is what is a what is a player in your your argument and the second is then um what is sort of the operating notion of the self then that would allow you to have you know kind of really fruitful solo play um <clears throat> let, let me think for a bit so a player is any person who is played. I think that's that's easy. The difficult part is what is a person. So for the purposes of my argument, I I'm defining the person as the individual that exists at that place and time. Because what defines a person in that regard is their cognitive ability, their experiences who they are, how they think, and the memories they have. So my argument hinges that uh, throughout your life, you are different people. I'm not the same person as I was when I was five years old. I'm not the same person as I was um, at the beginning of the seminar. 
for instance, there are many, like many points that were that were presented here. Many arguments, uh, uh, lots of information that gave me a new perspective. So if I were to, I don't know, um, if I were to submit a new project today, maybe I would have a new set of, of formative experiences that would guide me. In that sense, this separation of time makes us different people for many reasons. And this is why I argue that, that we are constantly playing against ourselves. So it's not possible to have a truly solo experience because you're always competing against what you know you can achieve. So I, I gave you the example of the two puzzles that I built. So when I was building the second puzzle, I was always comparing myself to myself previously. And when we think about that, when we think about ourselves as a third uh, party, that's what means you have two different players interacting with each other. And you know, for instance, when you uh, pick up a new hobby, for instance, you also know that you in the future will be able to achieve things that you can't now. And you also are not able to think of yourself in the future as truly yourself because you're not there yet. You're not able to be there and experience what you are going to experience in the future. That's my main argument. Did I answer the question? Yeah, brilliant, actually. That, that makes all your, a lot of other pieces in your um, presentation fall into place because of the temporality being the main uh, delineation between the different, you know, uh, yous that are that are that are being played, and and that you know, then that temporality, as we were discussing with Landy's paper, has an ontological quality, and that that then mechanics are um, activating a relationship, not just you know, uh, are, are are not just just following rules, but but they are activating a relationship to a previous self, and again, a a not to be conceived future self. Thank you. Thank this you. is. A, the next question then is for for Eddie and Bridget. Um, and this was related to again. This is a really fascinating study, and I, and I appreciate that you tried to fit it into fifteen minutes. Um, again, the uh, the thing that got me really curious were the like mechanics patterns between entertainment and serious games that you went by at light speed. So I'd love to to just talk with you a little bit about what those trends were and uh and then the second sort of point is 2002 as this kind of watershed year you know in in games history we can only after you know maybe 10 15 years can really begin to describe the shape of which years were really decisive and of course for role-playing games not only is 1974 1975 uh, crucial because of the creation of Dungeons and Dragons, but it's also crucial in defining what is both the primary Dungeons and Dragons market and the secondary market, right? Which is, um, you know, um, Unguard and and the other game Tunnels and Trolls that came out in 1975. And so that by 1975, end of 1975, there's a thing called role playing game that forever after will be called role playing game for actually business reasons, as John Peterson describes. So to some degree, then we're looking at 2002 as a watershed year where a thing called a serious game comes into being, even though we know from simulation and gaming that, of course, these kinds of serious games have been in motion since the 50s, if not earlier. Um, so that that's the second question. The first question is what what mechanical patterns did you you observe really between the entertainment and serious um, games that we glossed over? And the second is, okay, two thousand and two, is this you know, in ten years, are we going to look even more kind of decisively at as that that is the year that serious games came into being? Uh, yeah, those are great questions. So, um, I guess I can also, share the mechanics thing so folks could actually see it again. Yeah, sorry, it's a lot of uh, different visualizations to try and stuff it. Yeah, I, <laughs> what, what I'm doing is I'm clicking you. I'm, I'm, I'm reaching out of the, through the screen across the either and clicking and saying, no, no, back up and then <laughs> and, 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 and do that thing again. 
Yeah. No, no, sorry if I'm so crass that. about it, but I I definitely was just really curious. Here we are. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, um, it's kind of interesting because I think some of the the higher they're organized in frequency. So dice rolling is the most frequently occurring uh, mechanic. Um, and it kind of works its way down. These are the top 35 out of all the data set. Um, and so those top ones seem to really kind of like skew. They're much heavier than than the lower mechanics, which is um, not so much the case when we looked at categories. Um, but even still, you can kind of tell there's some pretty notable gaps um, with serious games where there's just like, empty white patches. Um, and a lot of these are uh, things like fighting, uh, grids, uh, like a lot more of, I guess one might be hard to justify <laughs> to parents and educators that you should buy this. Um, but two, like maybe isn't being as exploratory with like the different types of board game forms that it could take. So like what types of uh, boards could you have? What kinds of movement and mechanics could you have? actually utilize there. Um, it's kind of interesting too, because uh, this kind of washes it out a little bit, but if you look at it over um, different breakdowns of categories, so like math versus environmental versus history, you do actually see some trends. So um, like you don't see much voting and role-playing in the overall, but when you do actually look at political, that's a pretty major set of mechanics in there um stakeholding that kind of stuff uh so there's some interesting things to kind of look at and take away um i actually don't want to say too much because one of the fun things with visualizations is that um they're really meant to be open for everyone to look at and interpret um, and so i don't want to bring too much of my personal bias and expertise to it and i'd actually love to hear other people's thoughts and interpretations i was kind of reading the um the discord on it and it was it was great, um, like conversations of like different perspectives on like from this perspective, I saw this and that kind of thing. So I, I really I don't want to say too much, but I'd love to hear thoughts about it in the discord or here uh, if people have specific things they're noticing as well, because that's always cool stuff for me to dive into. I guess one one pattern again from, from the the bottom part of the list is reminding me of uh, gaming again as a subversive and very state regulated activity because gaming you know up until the mid to late twentieth century is associated with gambling and that has to be regulated right so auction and bidding is really where where you're you're there but when when you're thinking about okay these have to be um, justified to stakeholders in the community or in education that then uh, trick taking push your luck betting and bluffing right are suddenly not that they don't have the same sort of educational um you know kind of quality and and and, and again begin to invoke the role of the state as regulating say lotteries to again recall the loot box presentation from earlier so yeah that, that's just one thing i notice uh, others can of course put, throw in in the discord or if there um there's actually a question now in in the q a um from danielle i don't recall but did you also pull the age ranges for serious games could that be a reason for some of the mechanics being blank so that is a question uh, additionally for you and your team yeah, that, that's also a great question. So I did pull them. I pulled uh, all the data I could get pretty much other than user reviews, because that's a lot of data. Uh, but uh, I didn't actually analyze them yet, because that would then break it down into another level of segmenting and then, which I think would give us more insight. And I do think that actually could explain some of it. Like I, I imagine, because children's games is such a heavy category in educational that if we broke it down by age range, you might see the political being more adult skewing uh, or that kind of thing, uh, even history. And so there might be some different mechanics that show up that way. So that's a really interesting suggestion. I actually might do that for the full, full paper. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I, and I really, well, I, I, I think as nice as your disposition of seeing this as, a, as opening a door of opportunity for uh, people in serious game design and educational design and say, here is what generally is done, right? Generally, you roll dice and manage your hands. Mm -hmm. But you know, there are many things you could do. Uh, and, and again, the, the roll, spin, and move, uh, uh, you know, bias here is also 
uh, not only not only apparent, but also at, for any of us who've taught a analog game design course, we know that that is also the default that people choose for uh, any kind of you know storytelling game that's not abstract like the games that Malay is studying. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I, 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 sorry, did I cut you off? Oh, I was just going to say for the for the last question about the is two thousand two a landmark year? Um, I think it is. Uh, I think 1970 is as well, because that's sort of when serious games, the term was first coined um, and where they kind of acknowledged war games. But I think 2002 is when it really kind of became a broad thing. And that's what we've started to see as kind of a ripple effect all these years later. Yeah, that reminds us of the importance of language that, you know, again, people, as soon as something is defined and people kvetch, they, they are just so annoyed that something is defined is not designed the same way. But, you know, often those... Uh, those words are action plans, right? The words become verbs. And so once you say there's something called serious games in the world, then it actually does change a paradigm. And sometimes it's as simple as making a new word come into being. So thank you. Uh, our next round of questions is for Greg and uh, my proxy, Jason Perez. Um, so in role-playing games, we have a concept called character non-monogamy. Non which is to say you might have one character, you might have five and you can, you can, you know, control them or whatever. Uh, you know, we, we have a couple of more abstract like historical or movement games uh, such as microscope or um, the quiet year, which I mentioned both in, in, in discord, but um, you know, those, those again, emphasize the role-playing aspect. And I think what's very um conflicting about microscope is the macro to micro shift the macro perspective being like gee i can sit down and reframe the original star wars trilogy and make that the you know leia is in charge of the second death star and not you know the emperor and 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 that's cool but then there's the micro level where you actually have to sit down and role play it out okay i'm gonna play leia are you gonna play you know luke and 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 you know, my Leia has an eye patch, and uh, and and, and you, you know, you, you're sort of, you're sort of spinning spinning up your your fanfic, but at the same time, uh, that's a different, that's an entirely different game than kind of this pre pre deciding the historical events, and um and your game game is is, is sort of refused to go down into the you know the micro level, um, uh, does that uh. Does that choice have any kind of grounding, or are you 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 know quite quite confident that again you're going to participate um, at this kind of abstract you know the people level and and think that that will be uh, just as effective as to not adopt sort of the biases of individual subjectivity in psychology? Yes, thank you. Good good question. I appreciate it, and I love the quiet year microscope shout out. Um, I had not heard of character non monogamy, but that's very good. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, our, we didn't, this was not like an intentional, you know, uh, polarity that we were interrogating while we were designing, uh, we sort of mapped these theories onto it. But uh, that said, we definitely did decide very intentionally that like, this is not a game about the players as fictional historians, or even as sort of like, collectively the mind of Howard Zinn, which was another thing we talked about you know, we wanted to move the, the focus off of that and even off of off of Zinn, but like to the, the actual historical personages and events. And so we we centered those and we had talked about sort of like, oh, maybe you go and meet, you know, uh, Oni Judge or something. But uh, ultimately, we decided that no, the, you know, for for using this game, A, as like an accessible game and B, as a like a possible teaching tool. It would make more sense to let that that more micro engagement with the historical content happen in like a debrief setting as opposed to during the gameplay itself. Yeah, I, I, one thing I, I I struggle with, and especially when um, dealing with these kinds of situations where you're, you're, you're they're both specific historical events and also kind of parable, like you know here's a, a power situation and you will learn perhaps something about power from this situation is how 
uh, almost immediately the players, uh, and uh, this is coming from specifically my experiences with Meg Baker's A Thousand One Nights, which is a game where you're, you know, you're all trapped in a court telling tales and the tales that you're telling refract in the characters and also have character consequences. Um, what happens is, is if I tell, if I have them tell like the Pied Piper or, you know, Little Bo Peep has lost their sheep, then people immediately are able to engage because of the, you know, sort of simple nature of their stories. And when I get to, here's where I get to your game, the, the kind of abstractions of like, you're playing death itself and you're playing longing and what, it, it, they, they lose the thread almost immediately. They, 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 I, I could never get very good play out of, out of the players that for for those particular kind of more abstract i would say intellectually ambitious ones everyone thought they could do the neil game in style fiction and when it came time for the actual play to happen sorry i'm, I'm going on i just it, it, i i watched some spectacular choking happening when we went back to little bo peep right because little bo peep was like an easy you know parable you know she she lost her sheep and then what's she gonna do right and 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 so uh, I wonder, again, in this kind of Brechtian or Bawalian sense of things, if you're looking to educate people about power dynamics, if the specificity uh, is is a, an element you want to sneak back in somehow. Yeah, for sure. The I mean, the sort of like, the, uh, to, to use a sort of, uh, you know, contested term, the sort of procedural rhetoric of the game is uh, fairly, fairly simple at that level. Like, we sort of just take Zinn at face value because we are adapting Zinn's book and we are working under the auspices of the Zinn estate. And so the things you're learning about power are hopefully things that, you know, you would also learn from the Zinn book. Um, but I take your point that it's like there is a there is a sort of underlayer or like a subtext happening there that, that we'll have to think about. I'm also happy you you brought up this example and specifically used the word parables because I'm I'm working on another project about religions and how they change over time that this these I've seen this this choke moment happen where people are like I'm going to swing big and then they strike out it's like ooh it's not a it's not a feel good moment but I, you want to preserve the space for people to swing big regardless yeah, and, and people's history of the United States does have a biblical quality, right? There is a you know we are now going to tell the tale of you know <laughs> uh, of of, of, of th this person, right? So I, I I think I think that you're you're playing with some really powerful material, and now I'm now I'm interested to see where you go with it. So wonderful. Thank um, you. I, finally, we're going to uh, conclude with with Malay's uh, uh, Q and A, and I I have a question here um from from joe and and it is as a game designer i try to design experiences the rules theme etc which are all subservient to those and are all available to be changed then if playtesting shows that the desired experience is not achieved so um to, to some degree uh experiences in joe's paradigm are first and then rules theme and everything else are kind of totally malleable what do you think of that uh, it's an interesting viewpoint, and uh, thanks for the comment. Uh, I think um, what tends to, so here, I think uh, I should have explained my context better. Um, so in India, the gaming context is, uh, or rather, the gaming Goffman and ga gaming contact, uh, gaming encounter is a bit uh, different than when I visited European countries and. Uh, the global north or something of that sort. Um, here, game designers, they still approach, they've just started moving away from designing games from a thematic perspective and started thinking from a mechanics perspective. Uh, so I think uh, what, uh, what your paradigm is, I think it's fairly advanced and that's what I am also arguing for, that games... Uh, should be uh, designed from a from an experience perspective. Um, from I mean, it it becomes it should be the super servant to uh, rules and mechanics because they becomes the mean to those experiences. Um, um, and experiences are the ultimate things, and designers should think in terms of experiences. Um, uh, what I what I st uh, what I argue for is for design research to be effective and articulate about and have have a point of view in uh, in analyzing experiences 
they have to design i think design research scholars they have to articulate in terms of the relations with the rule system because without rule system there there are very less i mean just describing experiences is not sufficient for a uh, designed research uh, i argue that it is necessary for a design research scholar to argue in terms of gameplay and the rules that create those gameplays so yeah that is my core argument if it uh, if it uh, addresses your comment i guess uh, but i also i was also curious in which context were you uh, 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 speaking about so if you can, we can take this conversation to Discord as well. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll shove that over to Discord because because Joe will be there as well. So so yes. Joe, you you and Malika can interact there. Uh, my final question again is related to this classification as events, which is also related to my question, my first question for Leonid. Um, and again, in my own schema for events for role playing game design, there is no difference between a player um rolling a die and a player going over to um the bathroom and a player then you know declaring that their character you know moves three spaces or whatever right these are all in my schema events which allows me to design so that you know mm -hmm. for example i can see if my my game makes players go to the bathroom a lot and how that disrupts the game right but to some degree then then if you take them all seriously as events that will um you know, uh, that, that will allow you to see the design that's not just the game internally, but also the humans around the game and how they're yeah. interacting with it. Um, right. I, I want to just clarify then the role of hypotheses in, uh, in that event structure. So from what I understand, um, then uh, you can take any experience or any event right and and kind of pause it or even have the player like kind of note it and then make a guess about you know if this goes on or what if you know x happens is that correct yes yes so uh, these hypotheses are formulated by players about the game system or what the other players would do they could do and it is in general this it is it Basically, through hypotheses that test their understanding about the game system, um, and and they keep and games make players evolve their hypotheses uh, through the gameplay. Uh, that is what these events, uh, this particular event says. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. It also uh, mirrors what developments that we see in cognitive film studies, specifically that when we uh, sit down to watch a movie, we're already making guesses about the plot, right. about what will happen to so and so, and 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 that that uh, one of the main uh, objectives of a filmmaker is to create something in relationship to that that uh, cognitive model that an audience member develops. Right. Correct. Yes. Um. Okay, then, then at, at this uh, point, can you can uh, is it it is called mirror? Uh, I I am not aware of that reference. I I really want to look that up. So um, so, uh, so 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 this is um again where where I we was calling it uh, cognitive uh, film theory. Uh, they these it's represented by people like Murray Smith, um, who are. Um, very interested in, you know, not only the emotional state of, of the audience, which is, you know, we're always like, what's the mood? What are specific pings of emotion within that mood? And then what are the, what we consider to be rational or logical uh, questions that are being posed, again, against the backdrop of emotion, never presuming that people are perfectly rational. Um, right. in the middle of, of something and the, the, you right. can explore like say the beginning of Raiders of Lost Ark uh, the Indiana Jones mm -hmm. movie which which if you really watch it that that beginning has nothing to do with the plot absolutely right. nothing but it sets up the entire mood cue emotion system for the movie and uh, you know there there are games that do this as well right where the, you know here here is a uh, tutorial that that uh, you know, may orient you you towards uh, the movements of the game, but have nothing to do with the game, uh, per se. Right. I, I always think of Lara Croft in her house uh, in Tomb Raider or something like that. 
Um, mm -hmm. But in any case, uh, all, all colonialist video games and films aside, I am quite thankful that, that, that we were able to have this discussion today, thanks to Generation Analog. Um, again, uh, this is this is the final panel for the day. If you stick around, we will move into a different mode and, and hang out. But otherwise, I want to thank all of our pre presenters, um, all of our, our staff and, and support team. Again, we're looking at a, a team of 13 people or so who who are behind the scenes and that uh, and, and, and so there are those of us who are up front, but we are just part of a, a larger collective and we are so grateful for everyone's work on this. Uh, thanks everyone. And uh, we hope you hang out with us in a couple of minutes. <laughs>